while Citizens United is a, is a bad circumstance, on the federal level, Oregon is far worse than Citizens United. Oregon's campaign finance laws are Citizens United on steroids because they not only... Okay, hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy, the Populist Dialogues. I'm your host today, Dr. Don Bayham, filling in for David Doak, who is kind of under the weather. Hopefully by the time this is broadcast, he will be not under the weather anymore. So my guest today is Dan Meek. And the title for this particular show is Campaign Finance Reform and Filibuster. So, hello, Dan. <laughs> Good to see you again. Greetings. <laughs> You've been on my other show, mm -hmm. uh, Conversations with Dr. Don, a number of times through the years. And each time it's been a delightful experience. And have you changed since then? No. Well, I, I know more now than I used to. Know. That's impossible. <laughs> I like uh, I'm not as nervous as I usually am when you're aboard because usually you have your laptop and you get into so many charts and slides until I don't know where to go anymore. But you don't have your laptop, so we can talk. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the uh, the editor will add the slides later. Yeah, how you doing? All right, pretty good. Yeah, so shall we get started? All right. The Campaign Finance Reform and filibuster. Why did you choose that title? Well, the first thing I wanted to, to mention was what's happened in the United States Congress with, with so-called filibuster reform. The this U.S. Congress. The huh? U.S. Congress. This mm -hmm. is a topic that, um, that David Delk and I have, have presented a couple of times, I think, on, on his show, on this show. And uh, the problem is that... Um, the minority in the Senate, which is currently Republicans, mm -hmm. have been um, using the filibuster to effectively eliminate the, the uh, will of the majority, majority being about uh, 55 Democrats to about, uh, plus independents who, who vote with the Democrats, uh, mm -hmm. to about 45 Republicans. And um, in past centuries, the filibuster has been used extremely rarely, maybe once or twice a decade. But in the, in the last um, four or five years, it's been used um, four or five hundred times. Mm. And since um, there was a change in, this, in the Senate rules in 1975 that really, that really resulted in this problem, and that is it allowed, instead of having, uh, before that, you, in order to do a filibuster, you actually had to, uh, if you were a senator, you actually had to go to the floor of the Senate and start talking and keep talking. And, and you, stay there. And stay there. And mm -hmm. if you had to uh, relieve yourself or excuse yourself, then you had to have somebody else take over talking. Mm -hmm. So um, it was what was called a talking filibuster. Um, they eliminated that in 1975, um, in so that the uh, it's so that the, f the floor of the Senate is sort of like a multitasking computer. Many things can be going on at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, instead of a monotasking computer where you're just looking at one bill and if there's a filibuster, somebody has to, to stand there and speak. So what they have allowed since 1975 is that any senator can say, you know, I'm, I filibuster, and then the Senate goes on to other business. And so it's a, a silent filibuster. No one's actually there. It's just Supposedly, this filibuster is happening, but nobody sees it, and nobody has to be on the floor of the Senate. And how long does it go on? In for an infinite period of time until uh, there's a, a cloture vote, which requires, under the uh, Senate rules, uh, so 60 votes. So one senator can filibuster? Can filibuster without even being there. And in okay. fact, the rules were then again changed in the, in the 2000s to allow these... Um, the silent filibusters to be anonymous silent filibusters. Anonymous. So, I'll, all that I, if I'm a senator and I want to filibuster a bill or the uh, the a presidential nomination to the to the courts or to a cabinet position or to any other position, mm -hmm. all I have to do is call up my my party leader, you know, Harry Reid or Mitch McConnell, and say, okay, I'm putting on a silent filibuster on this bill or nomination, an anonymous silent filibuster. That's so then the leader up. goes to the to the floor and says, "Okay, uh, sorry, you know they don't identify it as an anonymous silent filibuster. They just say it's a hold." And so any any senator can in secret uh, place a a secret hold on any bill or uh, or any nomination, and all of that has to be overcome by sixty votes. What's happened to our democracy? Well, it's ridiculous. So. The, the champion of filibuster reform in the Senate since he was elected in 2008 is Jeff Merkley of Oregon. Yay! He tried to get it reformed in 2008 and got and in the beginning of 2011 and got nowhere. 
and he tried again in the beginning of 2013. The reason, you st it, the reason reform is best done at the beginning of each congressional session is because one of the, f in fact, the first act that the Senate has to do is adopt its own rules. Of course. And when it adopts its own rules, they can adopt or change its, adopt the rules on a straight majority vote, 51 vote. Mm -hmm. So you can change the, filib the rules about filibuster simply by, with majority. a straight majority vote. Mm -hmm. So um, after the, the Republicans continued their hundreds of silent filibusters in this past congressional session, the uh, Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid said publicly that he agreed with Merkley that we needed to reform the filibuster. Merkley was right that, that uh, the filibuster should have been reformed in, in 2011, but wasn't. But Why did they filibuster so many times? Because the Republicans don't want bills to pass. For example, um, in, uh, when the health care reform bill was up, um, the reason that there's no public option in the health care reform bill is because 60 votes could not be, could not be corralled for that provision in the Senate. The so House passed the public option. Yeah. But this, in the Senate, there, weren't, there were only 59 votes for it, so it never happened. To override a filibuster. Um, there were only 59 votes, in, for example, in favor of a public option, or in 2010, there, were, there was uh, 59 votes in favor of requiring disclosure of independent expenditures, unlimited independent expenditures unleashed by the Citizens United decision. And, of course, the requirement for disclosure of where the money is coming from was defeated on a vote of 59 to 37, oh, with the 59 losing, believe it or not. That's a losing vote, 59. Democracy? Where is it? So it, it makes a big difference. So uh, once again, Jeff Merkley, over the past couple of weeks, well, he's been working on it for a couple of years, but um, the Senate on January 23rd um, decide, you know, decided on its rules, decided what to do about this, and did effectively nothing. Um, mm. they, they slightly changed one of several opportunities to filibuster a bill. It's called on a motion to proceed. But anyone can still filibuster during debate of the bill. Each bill beforehand uh, could have been filibustered about four times. Now each bill can only be filibustered three times, and in each case requiring a 60-vote majority to proceed, to, to in, go on to the in, next in step. In each case. And you, the senators can still do secret holds. That is, they can still place a hold on a bill without even identifying themselves. There's a, there's a gentleman's agreement between the majority and minority leader that they'd, they'd identify, who, you know, that these folks should be identified. Well, where but, are the gentlemen in this? But there's no rule. Okay. So, uh, so filibuster reform has failed, and, th and that means that the, the Democrats in the Senate um, continue to give away their majority, basically. They... Um, they have majority power. They refuse to use it. Well, when is this going to change so that it can go back so, to a simple majority to uh, defeat a, an attempt to filibuster? It would probably change when the Republicans get the majority. They'll change it. <laughs> you think <they> would? <laughs> <laughs> kind of partisan. They'll change it. They'll, if they're the majority, they'll, they'll get rid of the filibuster, I think, uh -huh. because they have the, once they have the majority, they have the will to use their power. The Democrats in the Senate do not have the will to use their power. Instead, they give it away. How does campaign finance play into the situation with the filibuster and the power of the filibuster? Well, um, it's one reason uh, that we won't, that campaign finance is in dire condition on the federal level. The amount of uh, money being spent on federal elections, particularly these independent expenditures, increased by about a factor of five in the last election went up from $200 million to uh, over a billion dollars spent by outside groups. And the outside groups have the option of not even identifying themselves. This is a result of Citizens United? That's the result of Citizens United, yes. And it's a result of Congress not taking any action to overcome Citizens United. They could have taken action and could take action to overcome it, but they haven't done that. They could remove the, remove the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court over campaign finance reform laws. Whew. They could uh, add two more members to the Supreme Court and let Obama appoint two more members who, who uh, presumably would then vote to overturn Citizens United. There are a variety of things that Congress could do effectively. But um, Democrats, when they had very large majorities in the House and Senate in 2010 and 2000, pardon me, in 2009 and 2010, uh, didn't do anything about it, didn't even require disclosure. They wanted to work with the other side. Well, up until that time, um, they were the beneficiaries of independent expenditures to a larger extent than the Republicans. They actually got more independent expenditure money, which basically comes from corporations and corporate executives, more of it spent on behalf of Democrats than Republicans. So they figured, really? oh, this is, 
who cares if there, we had more independent expenditures? Of course, um, once it became clear that these, under Citizens United, that these expenditures were unlimited, the corporations shifted their money to the Republicans. So, um, and took basically, uh, using that mechanism, uh, took back the uh, House of Representatives in the 2010 election. Um, and so it makes a big difference. But in what some folks may not realize is that while Citizens United is a, is a bad circumstance, on the federal level, Oregon is far worse than Citizens United. Oregon's campaign finance laws are Citizens United on steroids because they not only um, are, uh, as they're not enforced anyway, they are in Oregon, any corporation or person or union or any kind of entity can make unlimited independent expenditures, but can also make unlimited contributions directly to candidates. In Oregon. In Oregon. And that's different than the, the Citizens United on a national level. On a national level, there are limits on uh, contributions by any by anyone to a, a candidate's campaign. For example, on the federal level, that is president and Congress, um, all corporation all contributions by corporations have been banned since 1907. All corporation all contributions by unions have been banned since the 1940s, and contributions by individuals are limited to a couple of thousand dollars per individual per race. In case we have some really new voters viewers here, Citizens United, can you say a few words about what that means, the Citizens United decision? That was a five to four decision mm -hmm. by the United States Supreme Court in January of 2010 that um, stated that um, spending money independently of a candidate's campaign mm -hmm. is uh, protected speech under the First Amendment and can't be limited. Protected speech, spending money is speech? Uh, in fact, yes, that's what the Supreme Court decided. Of course, Oregon decided that in 1997. So, this, 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 and, and Oregon decided that not only independent spending is was protected speech, but giving money directly to a candidate was protected speech. And what's the result of that? Well, the result, if you, I've got a, a couple of slides here, uh -huh. and if you look at uh, slide number two, you'll see that since the um, Oregon uh, initiative that was passed in 1994. Spending on Oregon legislature races. Right. Uh -huh. Since 19, since the Oregon initiative was uh, overturned in by the Oregon Supreme Court in 1997, the amount of money spent on legislative races in Oregon has skyrocketed, basically from about $4 million before the, that, that decision to over uh, $24 million now. So uh, the initiative was overturned? Yes. What's the initiative? That initiative was Measure 9 of 1994. Uh-huh. Um, and what, what, what was it supposed to do? Well, it enacted limits on contributions, okay. political contributions in Oregon. Mm -hmm. So with the absence of those limits now, the amount um, contributed to candidates and spent on legislative races oh. by candidates is increased by a factor of six. Slide three indicates that the spending in, in governor, the race for governor, is increased from about $2 million when those limits were, were um, even when those limits weren't in effect, they weren't in effect in 1998 because the Oregon Supreme Court struck them down in 1997. So slide three is spending on Oregon governor races. Right. And it shows that that's gone up from about $2 million to over $20 million in the last time that a governor was elected in 2010. So money speaks with a loud voice. It does. And um, the, um, the of particular concern, I think, are the legislative races. Um, it yeah. Now, we have 60 yeah. House districts in Oregon. It takes about 12 or 13,000 votes to win a House race. Not very many. Uh -huh. They're pretty small districts. But in 2010, as slide four indicates, the winners of contested House races spent up to $590,000. Slide four to is win. legislators spend lots of cash. Right. Okay. So it cost uh, in 2010. Um, if there was a contested House race, it cost the winner usually around $600,000 to win. Some House races have cost as much, the winner has spent as much as $1.1 million to win that race. So we're talking about on the order of 80 to even $100 per vote being spent uh, to win um, legislative House races in Oregon. And um, even more being spent, um, uh, more more absolute amounts of money being spent to win the Senate races. And where do they get that money to run their campaign? Well, they get the money basically mainly from uh, corporations and business executives on, on the one hand. That's for Republicans. Democrats sort of get about half of it from them and 
half of it from uh, the the unions, mainly public em public employee unions, public sector employee unions. So you're trying to do something and dry up the monies that are used uh, uh, for candidates and political uh, processes, so that these guys don't have all this money to spend on their campaigns. That's true. It's and we're trying to bring Oregon into the modern era and join the other 46 states with limits on on political campaign. 46 states do, huh? Oh yes. Okay. Um, so. Um, the, we don't have final numbers for the 2012 races yet, um, but the Oregonian has reported that the 2012 races for the Oregon House uh, were, again, at a record level. Even, That's slide five. Even more than that on slide five. Uh -huh. um, to indicate Oregon's um, sort of lack of, uh, of standing in this area, slide six indicates is a, were the results of a study uh, called the State Integrity Investigation. Oregon Law on Integrity, in slide done, six. Done in 2012 by the Center for Public Integrity, uh, by other organizations, and by Public Radio International. Mm -hmm. um, and they gave Oregon an overall grade on integrity of C minus. And you'll notice that uh, in the first uh, item in the second column there says political financing, Oregon got a D minus. D minus. How, can, how low can you go? Um, I don't know if anyone got an F, but Oregon certainly <laughs> got a B minus uh, on that. Um, and Oregon is not only not only lacks limits on contributions, so um, you know it's not unusual at all for a and the executive of a of a of a corporation to contribute three hundred dollars to a candidate's campaign. Uh, pardon me, three hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars to a candidate's campaign. Or, for example, in the last governor's race, the Oregon the Republican Governors Association contributed. Um, trying to think how much, um, over a million dollars to the Republican governor's campaign. And the Republican governor's association's money also comes from secret sources. But Oregon also, as indicated in the seventh slide, uh, even lacks disclosure for, uh, a lot for a substantial portion of the amount spent. Uh, slide seven, Oregon sl lacks disclosure. In, um, before 2001, Oregon had a law that required that every political ad identify um, who sponsored its source, it? who was responsible for it. Uh -huh. uh, the Oregon legislature uh, conveniently repealed that law in 2001. Because they don't want you to know they're buying. They don't it. want you to know where the where the ads are coming from. And I was, as I recall, the only one who testified against that change. Mm -hmm. You are an attorney, of course. Sure. Yeah. Then there was an organization, a, a large group of, of organizations, including. Public Citizen and the and the uh, public interest research groups and others mm -hmm. in last year that um, concluded that only six states have worse systems for disclosing independent expenditures in Oregon. They ranked Oregon an F well. in disclosing independent expenditures. Why is that? Because of the Oregon political process and no campaign finance reform, or what? Well, in Oregon, let's say a if a a company or an individual or anyone uh, decides to run their own campaign for or against a candidate and spends any amount of money, any unlimited amount of money, they are required to report that to the state of Oregon. Mm -hmm. But the state of Oregon doesn't publish that anywhere. What do they do with the data? They put it in a binder in Salem. And how do you have access to it? You can go look at the binder if you want to, but they don't pu they don't put it online and they don't publish it. Why is that? They don't want to, apparently. And why don't don't do they want to? You'd have to ask them. You know why they don't want us to know. Well, I think I think that's correct. Uh -huh. um, and in fact, there's a um, there is a bill being proposed by Secretary of State Brown in the current legislative session that would make this problem even worse. There's been a law How in Oregon worse? for decades that says that, um, let's say that you're a corporate, you form a corporation, and the only thing the corporation really does is spend money on, you know, on political ads. It raises money and spends it on political ads. Under current law, that corporation is required to report what's called its paid-in capital. That is, it's required to report where its money comes from. Okay. Because it's a, a kind of a purely political animal. So it's paid in capital is really the equivalent of a of a political contribution, and mm -hmm. the corporation is really the equivalent of a of a political committee. But the Oregon Secretary of State is now proposing to repeal that law, 
So anyone can spend $100, form as many corporations as they want, have amount, you know, get amounts from other people or corporations in the form of paid-in capital and not report it. So um, Oregon's law when it comes to campaign, um, political campaigns, is far more loophole than law. And that's why these various outside organizations you know, give Oregon either an F or a D minus uh, when it comes to laws governing uh, political campaigns. So Oregon is not too wonderful for ordinary citizens when it comes to uh, who uh, elects their, their governance. Well, um, Oregon now, uh, according to the Oregonian, um, it has the amount spent on races for the Oregon legislature per capita in Oregon is the highest of any state except New Jersey. And when you think about it, even at the lowest level of the legislature, the, the, um, the member of the House of Representatives, who only needs about 12,000 votes to get elected, um, it would, that would seem to be an opportunity for a you know, grassroots effort to actually succeed and, and, and nominate and elect uh, someone who's, who's there to represent the people. But when you think about it, where is the average person going to get Four hundred to six hundred thousand dollars to run a campaign. These campaigns, as you might have noticed in the last election cycle, they took over all of the television, both broadcast and and cable. Virtually all of the ads for the last uh, week or so, or two weeks before the election, were political ads. So that 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 uh, presumption that Oregon is part of the left coast and it's a, a liberal bastion. Uh, the, the the never mind. Okay. Is, is Oregon that liberal? Um, I don't think it is. Um, I think Oregon's government is controlled by is controlled by money is controlled by the political co contributors, mm -hmm. and um, the uh, so when you think about it, you, you know um, you need to come up with four hundred to six hundred thousand dollars or more to win a contested house race. And the other problem is that of the sixty house races in Oregon every two year every two years, only about ten of them are competitive. The rest of them aren't competitive because of the way. Um, the way the, the districts are drawn. That is, in, inside the city of Portland in the, in the Portland metropolitan area, um, the Democrat always wins because voter registration is overwhelmingly Democratic. Yes. In Eastern Oregon, Southern Oregon, um, voter registration is overwhelmingly Republican. So mm -hmm. the Republican is destined to win all of the House races and all of the Senate races. The only place where there's any competition among the two major parties is in the Portland suburbs, and around, kind of around Eugene, Springfield, and, and Bend. The universities. And to, to a small extent on the coast. Mm -hmm. um, so in this past year, for example, there were effectively no house, no races for the House of Representatives that were contested except for about 11 of them. And of the 15 Senate races, about four were actually, can, were actually there was any sort of a contest. So when you see these numbers, the amount of money going up, up, and up spent on, on campaigns, it's actually worse than it appears to be because the number of actually contested races is going down, down, and down. Okay. So the amount spent on each individual race um, in, continues to escalate. And let's say that you're, you get elected and you're a, a populist and you go to the Oregon legislature and somehow you got elected, and you do something that the corporations don't like, what's going to happen? They're not going to give any money the next time there's an election coming up. They're going to give a lot of money to your opponent. Yeah. And whether you're running in the general election next time or in the primary next time, you'll have an extremely well-funded opponent who can put on TV ads, send out uh, an unlimited number of large brochures, go on the radio, um, do, a, you know, do a lot of direct mail, and, and probably beat you. Because the person who's, and the candidate who spends the most money in Oregon races wins about 96% of the time. Money, money. And you're going to change that by? Well, we did change it in 2006. We enacted Measure 47, and, um, which limits politi political contributions. Um, that's been uh, the S Oregon Secretary of State and Attorney General uh, refused to enforce it. We took them to court, and the, f the Oregon Supreme Court issued a decision last October that declined to evaluate the constitutionality. Send it back. They just declined to evaluate the constitutionality of it and said that um, that the the plaintiffs had not presented a justiciable controversy. Now, I hesitate to try to explain what that means, but that is a doctrine that says that the, the court doesn't have to make a decision in a case if 
the decision would not have any concrete effect on anyone. Or, but in this case, you know, we're asking for a decision to validate the constitutionality of Measure 47. Certainly, its constitutionality would have a, a material, a huge effect on everyone because it would place into effect very strict limits on campaign contributions and expenditures. So we've asked the Supreme Court for reconsideration. I didn't think the Oregon Supreme Court was that conservative, to be generous with that term. It is conservative, huh? Well, it was a six to one decision. Uh, Justice Durham, Justice James Durham dissented. And then uh, he dissented, and then his term ex immediately expired. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, right there. So, yeah, so he dissented as he was, as he was heading out the door. Um, so we're winding down. We've got about a minute left. What yeah. do you need to say to the viewers in this last minute we have, Dan? Well, um, in order to guarantee that we can get campaign finance reform in Oregon, we need to amend the Oregon Constitution. Mm -hmm. And slide uh, number um, 12 is my proposed amendment to the Oregon Constitution in order to guarantee that we can have campaign finance reform and, dis and very stringent disclosure in the political ads themselves, slide who's paying 12, for them. Slide 12, amend Oregon Constitution, right. so go on. Right. Then, s then slide 13 is a Senate joint resolution uh, introduced in this session by, mainly by uh, five or six Democrats. That would, be a, that would be a good start. So what we need are folks to contact their legislators and say that they need to refer to voters an amendment to the Oregon Constitution, the amendment proposed by the Progressive Party, or even Senate Joint Resolution 19. Would be would be a good start. It would place into effect um, the limits on th that we enacted in 2006. I would note, however, that the Secretary of State has introduced the bill to repeal those limits. And we're going to have to stop. We're going to have to go on for two hours. <laughs> Thanks again for coming on David's show, and I'm glad I had a chance to sit in and chat with you again. Thanks, Don. But you'll be on my show again in the future, won't you? If I'm invited. You certainly are. Right. Good to see you again. Thanks again. Thanks, Populous Dialogues is now on YouTube. Go to youtube.com and search for Populous Dialogues. Click on the result with the Statue of Liberty icon to view all our shows this year and to subscribe. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. To learn more, Visit our national website at www.thealliancefordemocracy.org or our Portland website at www.afd-pdx.org. We want to thank the crew for getting us on the air again. Thank you to Joan Horton, Janet Morris, Beth Kerwin, Roger Bates, Dave King, and Brad Leach. Thank you also to the staff here at Portland Community Media for the use of studio space and equipment. And thank you, the audience. I hope that you will watch us again in the future. Thank you.